Guys, welcome to Better Bachelor. My name is Joker, and some say I have a face for radio, others a voice for print. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the uh, Solomon Ash conformity experiment and why the herd mentality and us trying to globalize and trying to bring everybody in the world together with similar values is going to probably be, honestly, the downfall of society today. Um, you know, when I was in uh, the Philippines, I have a tattoo that's about one inch on my back. It's in the middle of my back. It was from a woman named Wang Ud, and she's older than 100 years, and she used to tattoo uh, tribal headhunters in the Philippines. They literally went out and warred against other tribes, and when one, one member of her tribe killed somebody else in another tribe and brought back the head, then they got a tattoo for it. Well, needless to say, that's not been a practice uh, that is common <laughs> in Philippines for a little while. So uh, she just tattoos celebrities and other people. And I hiked in the woods and traveled uh, several hours and many jeepneys and hiking over mountains and down dirt paths to get to her village. And in this village was a few hundred people and they grew their own rice and they had chickens that they raised and, and uh, they had other vegetables and fruits and they got water where they went down a ravine, gathered water, brought it back up, boiled it and drank it. And uh, that's that's how they lived. The one thing that struck me, they even had a little schoolhouse there where they were ch teaching children, but what they were teaching them was Filipino culture, Filipino language. And what really struck me with this is everybody was so happy. Everybody got al along very well. They They acted like more than neighbors. They acted like a big family. And I don't remember the research, but somewhere it said that humans can really only care about 150 people at all. Like you can only really remember and have emotional attachment to about 150 people because that's how we were designed. So now when we try to globalize everything and we try to get everyone to care about everything and every problem that every person and every culture, you end up basically becoming very apathetic. Like you just can't care about that much. And and I know this is true because you see video of somebody getting beaten up and, and hurt uh, online and you go, man, that's awful. That really sucks. Moving on. Even if you want to care, even if you should care, the only time it really strikes home for some people if, if is it's an elderly person, if it's an animal like a puppy or a kitten or a child, because that's a universal inbred thing of we we need to look out for those of the of those that cannot look out for themselves. But when it's another dude and it's a fist fight and you see a guy get KO'd and falls face first and it's a meme and everybody's like laughing and joking and pointing, um, these are two people that just got in a physical confrontation and one of them got knocked out cold. Um, you should and and maybe even hurt himself seriously. You know, ends up face planting or something and breaking a nose or whatever, we now find, find humor in this where if you were in a smaller community, where when if you were with a group of people that actually cared about each other, not only would you want to not have them fight, but you'd want to try to resolve the issue and find out what's going on. Now we just we just find it funny. And, and look, I'm not saying I'm above anybody else. Like I've seen I've seen some stuff on the Internet that you kind of kind of have a laugh at or, or you, that. Uh, where, where it makes you do the lemon face, I call it, where you go, ooh, you know? But there, you, it's not an emotional impact where you can actually have empathy for this human being because we're inundated with so many things today that we don't have that empathy anymore. So the, the Solomon Ash conformity experiment, and one of the reasons why I mentioned this small village in the Philippines is because they're, they all have the same goal have the rice grow, have the chickens, have enough chickens, have enough food, be able to gather enough water and enough food. They did not have electricity. They did not have electrical pumps. I think they did have a reservoir of uh, something up because it's on a hillside and a pretty steep hillside. And it kind of came down then flattened out and then came down. And that's where the little village was. And then over on another hillside was the rice paddies that kind of were cut into layers down through the, um, the mountainside. And what I think they did is they had a, a water reservoir or something that caught water and they could, uh, they did have a couple of PVC pipes that came down that they could open up. And they did have concrete and some other things, but I mean, 
it was not by any means a, a modernized uh, village. But they all had the same goal of like loving each other, getting along very well, surviving, eating, having food, uh, teaching their young ones about their culture and, and hunting. And that was kind of it. And, and it's very much going back to basics. But they all had the very same similar long-term goal. Well, if you ask people today what their long-term goal is, it's different for everyone around the world. If you were to talk to many in other cultures, uh, their goals would be like to survive, to make, enough, uh, to make enough money to have food, water, a roof over my head. And, and, I, and I can say that firsthand. I've seen those type of villages and cities, whether it was in Egypt, whether it was in Thailand, whether it was in Southeast Asia, almost anywhere. Um, and then you go to, to something like Japan, and they're very modernized like we are. But if you ask someone that's maybe Japanese, like, what is your long-term goal? It's probably going to be a lot different than, than an American, which is different from, you know, a, a rural town German and different from someone living in the sub-Sahara of Africa. So by trying to bring everybody together, you end up getting this mishmash of uh, PC culture and politically correct and everybody needs to have – you need to respect the rights of every other human being even if your long-term goals are vastly different. Even if your culture, your religion, uh, the way that you look at the world is different, you, you need to respect that. And, and that's not going to work in the long time or in the long term. And I'm going to tell you why because we're going to read today from – uh, this is from Simple Psychology. I'm just going to read the, the intro to this, and then I have the uh, Wikipedia page. Now, if it comes to anything political um, or cultural, uh, Wikipedia is not a good source. But for something like this, it seems to be uh, pretty valid. And I came across this article, and what it is is Solomon, uh, Solomon Ash conducted an experiment to investigate the extent to which social pressures from a majority group could affect a person to conform. He believed the main problem with uh, Sheriff's 1935 conformity experiment was that there was no correct answer to the ambiguous autokinetic experiment. How could we be sure that a person conformed when there was no correct answer? So the, the kind of the idea of this is if I'm in a room and you ask me questions that seem to be relatively obvious um, and I, I would give an answer and it would be usually correct. But when you're surrounded by other people and they all give the wrong answer, would that change my correct answer to a wrong answer to fit in with the group? The reason why this is important today is because on Facebook, on social media, on Twitter, on the news media, just about everything is trying to get you to conform to a different way of viewing it. And a good example of this is of the uh, LGBTQ community. They have put a very big campaign forward that says not only did we we want the same rights as everyone to get married, which I'm fine with because they can suffer like everybody else, as I say often, uh, but we also want to teach this to kids. We want drag time story hour. We want to be able to go into schools. And if you say that biologically a male cannot biologically become a female and a female cannot biologically become a male, well, then you're going to be – that's considered now hateful speech, and that's going to be removed from social media. Well, to people that are, I would say, biologists or people of the religious community, almost any religious community, and many of us that have uh, a couple of atoms to rub together in our brain, uh, you can say that's not actually accurate. It's, you know, the world does not work like that, and because of that um, – a lot of a lot of creators and a lot of people are being silenced. My argument it always, is always the fact of you know next to me here I have a dog. Um, when he was a puppy, they they fixed them, and so he cannot procreate. Um, well, they remove his his boys, his testicles, and were they to continue and just remove his uh, phallic symbol, were they to remove anything those three parts that make him male? Uh, can he have puppies? Can another male come up behind him and get him to have puppies? And the answer, of course, is no. Well, the only difference between that and a human being when it comes to everything else is a human being is a, a smarter, more creative, more artistic, more com compassionate being. And they can say, but I feel, I feel differently than a man. But the, that still doesn't change biology. 
So the reason why I bring all this up is because if you disagree with that premise right now, you're being shut down on, on various platforms. And there's no way to force someone to believe differently unless it becomes per pervasive in the culture. And that is what they're trying to push. And the way they do that is by making people conform to something, even if they think it's wrong, because the next generation after that will be less likely to feel the original way and they'll be more likely to conform and so on and so forth until you have a generation of people that will completely conform with everything that they're told and that they will just believe, quote, the science, even though the science says otherwise. So let me read from the Wikipedia page, and then we're going to get into, I have a dating profile that's more than a dating profile. It's a full discussion on it, as well as a couple of, of examples that I've brought up. And I don't want to go too, too in depth because my longer videos don't seem to be enjoyed by many people. And I want the more people to kind of know about this stuff. So the ash conformity experiments from Wikipedia in psychology, ash conformity experiments or the ash paradigm were a series of studies directed by Solomon Ash studying if and how individuals yielded or defied a, ma a majority group and the effect of such influences on beliefs and opinions. Developed in the 1950s, the methodology remains in use by many researchers. Users' uh, uses include the study of conformity, effect of task importance, age, sex, and culture. They say here method. In 1951, Solomon Ash conducted his first uh, conformity laboratory, laboratory experiments in Swarthmore College, laying the foundation for his uh, remaining conformity studies. The experiment was published on two occasions. Groups of eight male college students participated in a simple uh, perceptual task in reality, uh, period. <laughs> in reality, all but one of the participants were actors, and the true focus of the study was about how the remaining participant would react to the actor's behavior. Now, let me pause here and say something. Number one, in 1950, and number two, they were men. In 1950, men were probably the most likely to not conform. They're usually the least uh, 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 least caring about society's woes as far as emotion. They're least likely to worry about how others perceive them or judge them. And they're, they're, they had a lot more integrity and certainly a lot more... Um, a much stronger belief system than we have today. So keep in mind when they're talking about the percentages here, we know this would be much, much different today. And what they show here is one of the cards used in the experiment. The card on the left has been, uh, has a reference line and the one on the right shows three comparison lines. And so what they did, and for the sake of brevity, I'll, I'll just kind of read through this portion of it. What they did is they took the one card and then they would compare it to the lines that say A, B, and C. And it may be a little tricky to tell here from my video screen, but it I can tell you now it lines up with C. So what they would do is they'd have all the actors that were in the room, which were seven or eight actors with the one normal person. And they would put the kind of normal person either in the middle of the pack or a little bit later in the pack. And they would say, okay, uh, which line corresponds to the length of this line, A, B, or C? And the first actor would say B an obvious false uh, comment. And the next one would say B and the next one would say B. And then the real participant at first, and I'll show the video of this, might say, mm, no, C. And the next one would say B and B and B. So he was the only one that was out. And after they ran this through a, for, a few times, they would, all of a sudden, the guy that was originally answering correctly would start changing his answer. And instead of reading this, which is a little bit dry. I, I think they made a link to the video and it may not be on this. It may be on the other page that I had there. Let me pull this one back up. But yeah, here's the procedure. They have it drawn out. They have a, a, several stooges and then Solomon Ash would give the experiment and then an innocent participant. But let me, um, I think this page, yeah, here's the video uh, clip. I'm going to play it through. They may hit me for copyright, um, but I'll, I'll fight it. I'll, I'll just have to break it up a little bit. Okay, I want to give you a test of your visual acuity, your sensitivity to differences in line lengths. So I'm going to show you a standard, and then I'm going to show you three comparison lines. One is going to be bigger, one is going to be shorter, and one is going to be the same size as the standard. Your job is, tell me which line, A, B, or C, is the same as the standard. 
And I'm just going to pause it here just so you guys can see here. And again, this breaks it up for YouTube because YouTube is what it is. But again, uh, you can kind of see they have the graphic here that popped down for YouTube, but you can see that it lines up with line B. Seems like a simple judgment. You always get it right. But now before you give your answer, there are going to be half dozen to 10 other people like you in the room and they're going to give their answers first. An amazing thing happens. One after another, they say the line that you see as shorter is the same as the standard. Shorter, 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 shorter. They don't say shorter, they just say B, 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 and so forth. Now it's your turn. You know B is the wrong answer. But what do you say? In this study done by Solomon Ash, a classic study of group conformity, the majority of people gave in gave in on most of the critical trials to agree with, to say publicly that they agreed with the majority. So, so let me just pause here again and say, so this is, this is the danger that we're in today, okay? Now, whether you agree with or disagree with getting the jab, whether you agree with or disagree with wearing a mask, whether you agree with or disagree with whatever, the point is that many people, now let's say you start with a group of 10 people, and I'm, I'm using this as an example, but this is something to be aware of because again, it's going through all things in life. Let's say you start with 10 people. One or two of those people, they know the right answer or they feel that they know the right answer, but everybody else is saying a different answer. So you look and you say, the lines say B, and before you it's A, 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 you say B, the, maybe the guy next to you says B, A, 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 A. After a while of running this through, uh, their, their argument is that one of those two or however many people will start go A, 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 A. And then stay, instead of saying B, this person says, you know what, maybe I'm wrong. Everybody else is saying A, and I'm the only one or only two of us are saying B. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going to say A because I... I I feel uncomfortable, I feel social pressure, and maybe I'm the crazy one, maybe I'm the wrong one, and I'm, so I'm gonna say A too, or, or whatever the other answer is. And then the person next to him that was saying B might also say, okay, so he's now saying A as well as everybody else, I'm the only person that's saying B now. So I guess A is the right answer, like maybe there's, maybe I'm misseeing something, so I say A. Now you have 10, 12, 15 people that say A, now put them in a room with another couple of people. They all say A, the new people say B, and eventually they start saying A, and more and more and more. And, of, and over time, if you go back to the 1940s and you can say, and you can look at Germany, and you say, how did a country get to the point where they were willing to do the atrocities they did against other people the way they did? It's because eventually either you're brainwashed or, or, you say, if I, there's so few of us that are standing out that I don't want everybody to come after me, so I'm not going to stand up for myself anymore. I'm just going to go along with the crowd. The same thing happens when you look at some of these crazy, wacko martial artists that are like doing fake Kai pushes and people are falling over. Ten people may fall over, and each one of those people are thinking, the other nine people believe this, but I don't but I'm going to fall with everybody else so that I don't seem like I stand out. If every person in that group feels the same way, all it takes is for one person to say, this is nonsense. And somebody else to say, I agree. And as that momentum builds, everybody would say, well, this is nonsense. And then that, that Kai master or whatever, he no longer has control over the mindset. Same thing happens when you look at some of these religious um, pastors on TV that can miraculously like praise Jesus and throw their hands out and heal somebody and the person collapse and all this. It's the same thing. Um, and, and again, I'm not putting down any, but there are charlatans that will convince other people to go along. Well, when you have today the media, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have YouTube, you have all these companies pushing the same line constantly, there, there are people that are going to fall in line. And after a while, they may even become to believe it. 
And what I find interesting about this the most, what I find the most interesting about this is that it, it do, it's not intelligent versus stupid. This is something that I actually did a little reading on and I found really interesting. It's not smart people versus dumb people. It's very empathic, caring, loving, uh, artistic, and emotional people versus pragmatic, logical, strong-willed, strong-minded um, people. And so the artistic, empathic people kind of go along with the flow and they don't want to feel socially isolated and they don't want to be called out, so they'll go along with it. Now, again, it doesn't matter how you feel on this topic, but when you look at the topic of the jab, you've got PhDs and doctors that go along with thinking that you should get it. You've got other doctors that say you should not because the science isn't there or the evidence isn't there. You've got people that are relatively not to be offensive, but less average, uh, less intelligent than average. You've got some of them that are all in and believing, hey, we should do what the government says and we should listen to them. They know what's best and do it. And you've got other people that are saying like, nope, I'll quit my job and I'll become homeless before I do that. Now, you could look at either group and say either group is wrong, but the point is the people that will hold to their their own beliefs and stay strong about this are are not dumber or smarter than someone that gives in. It's just they're less empathic and less emotional and that kind of thing. So be aware of that, that as we're talking about this, that's why many times some of you may agree with some of the things I say. It doesn't mean that I'm the smart one and you're the dumb one or vice versa. It doesn't mean that I'm the dumb one and you're the smart one. What it means is I have a set of value. I'm very strong-willed. I, I am the guy that if you say, hey, will you do this? Well, let me correct that. Hey, you need to do this. My first reaction is, well, why? No, I disagree. I fight back. I, and, and if it makes sense, I get it. Hey, the building's on fire. You need to leave. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. But I need data. I need science. I need mathematics. I need, but I need it from all sides because I am less empathic. I am less emotional. I am a, a numbers and data driven human being. So what happens when we're in a society the way we are today is that there are some people that are going to say, I don't see the data behind this. Nothing you say will convince me. And that's the problem we're running into with many things. But there are a lot of people that will also go along with it because they are empathic. So keep that in mind as we kind of continue on through this. I'm going to play this at a little bit faster speed just so we can kind of get through it here if YouTube will cooperate with me. Uh, let's see. Playback speed. And we'll do it at, we'll try it at one and a half speed, just so we can kind of get through this here. Well, this study is one of the first classic studies on the power of a group. As long as there's three or more people who agree among themselves that reality is not the way you see it, in many cases, you give in to see the world in their way. Let's look at that study. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card, there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left, and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with a white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 three, 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 three. But on the third trial, something happens. Two, 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 two. Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. One. Ash found subjects went along with the group on 37% of the critical trials. One. But he found through interviews One. that they went along with the group for different reasons. One. One. They must be right. There are four of them and one of me. Uh, one. This subject's yielding is based on a distortion of his judgment. He genuinely believes that the group is correct. One. 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 Two. One. Two. 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 I know they're wrong, but why should I make waves? Two. In this case, the subject knows he is right, but goes along to avoid the discomfort of disagreeing Two. with the group. Here, the distortion is at the level of his response. Two. 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 In the previous experiment, Two. the naive subject stood alone against the group. Two. In this variation, Ash gave the naive subject a partner, here seated in the third position, who also gives the correct response. One. One. Two. One. Um. 
two. With a partner, yielding drops to only 5% of the critical trials compared to 37% without a partner. Although subjects report warmth and good feeling toward the partner, they typically deny that he played a role in their own independence. Two. The partnership variation shows that much of the power of the group came not merely from its numbers, but from the unanimity of its opposition. When that unanimity is punctured, the group's power is greatly reduced. Sometimes we go along with a group because what they say convinces us they are right. This is called informational conformity. Let me pause it here for a second and say this. So you hear all it takes is one other person in the group to break up the, the one person's uh, thinking that he's wrong. So if out of this group, I don't know how many was it, eight or whatever it is, in the group of eight, if only one person had a different opinion, he would 37% of the time, they would change their mind and become one of the group. Some say they did it because they didn't want to feel uh, ostracized or alone in their decisions. And uh, other people uh, went along because they said, well, I, I, I know I'm right, but maybe my perception is off and everybody else is going, so it must be me. They're like they're, maybe there's something wrong with me. Well, again, these are students in the 1950s, all male. Uh, you can't probably look for a more uh, rebellious, strong-willed group of people. But were you to sprinkle in the groupthink and women and very empathic women into this today, especially today, and weaker guys? And when I say weaker, I don't mean phys physically or anything like that. I mean weaker as far as logic versus emotion. They're weaker logically, but they're motion more emotional. Were you to mix these people into the group, um, before you know it, they would all conform and they would either be, conf all, and, and I think it'd be much higher than 37% is my point. Because if it, be, if it becomes over 50%, then you've actually, you've got a, a, an R value that is higher than R naught, right? It's a growing perception. So 50% of people are walking around saying this well, then it may eventually become 55 and then 60 and then 65, and that will continue to grow. That's how only 10% or 15% of a population that can be very vocal can overcome the senses and the logic of an entire culture. I mean, if you look at many of the movements that we have today, the, the people that start them or are in them or are uh, and kind of initiating them are 10 or 15% of the population, but they scream, they holler, they fight, and they can convince others that they're right and they believe that they're in the right and that will grow and that will continue to grow until it becomes the popular. And once it's the popular, whether you're in a democratic or a representative government, it takes over. And it's very hard for people to get out of this group think because you, you have to be an individual. You have to stand up for your beliefs and what your eyes and your logic and everything is telling you. And at the same time, not caring what society thinks about you. This is why many of us are here on these channels because they say, look, you're saying these things to me. I know different and I don't care what you think. I know what I believe and I know what I've experienced and I know what I know and I'm going to talk about it. And you've, you've seen even with many men's channels, they try to shut that down. Why? Because the more people that stand up and they say, hey, this is not right. I still disagree. It gives strength to other people that don't agree. But th once they start tamping that down and they start tamping down the disagreeers, then more people will just go along because they don't want to be ostracized or uh, ostracized or stand out from the community. So it, when, and I specifically talk about that here because 37% when it was just one person versus 5% when the person had a, and a, somebody else that agreed with them. That's why we talk about the stuff we do. That's why we put out the videos we do. That's why we continue to push back against the society. Now, what's interesting is when it comes to politics, both people on both sides of the quote unquote aisle believe they are correct. And what, and, and it can go both ways too. Again, it's not smart and dumb versus smart and dumb or whatever. It's, it's the empathic, compassionate uh, people that fully become in, involved and gripped by the herd, as it were. 
And so that's why many of the, the people that in this country, at least in the United States, that are independent voters, which is what I classify myself as, look not at the group think, not at the group dynamic. We look at the individual, the individual that we're voting for, the individual that we're, we're dealing with, whatever, which is why it's also easy for me to say, hey, you know what? There are awful people out there in the world, but I don't paint all of them with one brush whether it's it's two different races or minorities or you know two black people versus two latino versus two versus two white people versus two asian people versus two women versus two men each one of them are completely unique and different and none of them may have the same thoughts none of them have the same personalities none of them have the same values but what happens in a society is when they start taking these brushes and painting everybody in these groups as the same, that they do it from empathy and care and we want to help these people and we want to make sure, but they assume all people are the same, which is why you can hear some people say, you know what, Oprah Winfrey is a, a black woman and she is, um, the patriarchy holds minorities down or, or black people down. Well, she's a billionaire. What about the white guy that's homeless or vice versa or vice versa? This could go either way, right? And they'll say, well, yes, the, the, the white homeless man has privilege because of his skin color and he has more privilege than a billionaire black woman. And for many people, they say, this does not make any sense to me. It's because they're not looking at Oprah or this homeless guy as individuals. They're looking at them. They're looking at these two people as part of a whole. He is white man. He's part of the white man group. Thus, he has privilege over black people and black people, even though it's Oprah and she's a woman and she's a billionaire, she's part of this other group. And that's why this group has control over this group. The minute you've done this, as you can see, you're, you're going to get a very strong and permanent bifurcation of society because there are people like me that will not conform. But the thing of it is, there are people that will agree with me, but will conform because they they don't have the independence to stand up. This is why they're trying to get rid of masculinity and strength and stoicism and independent thought and being uh, uh, less less creative and more logical. This is why they're they're trying to change the way we teach math. This is why they're talking about. Um, uh, people should be less uh, less critical and just kind of go with what's best, hoping that you'll go along with them. So again, kind of keep that in mind as 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 you watch this. Again, it's not smart versus stupid. It's empathic and caring versus stoic and um, principled. But sometimes we conform because we are apprehensive that the group will disapprove if we are deviant. This is called normative conformity. The strength of the normative factor is shown in another variation carried out by Ash. In this variation, the subject is told that because he had arrived late, he would have to write his answers. Subjects in this private response experiment are exposed to the same amount of misleading information as other subjects, but they are immune from any possible criticism by the group. One. 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 And this enormously reduces the pressure to conform. Conformity drops by two-thirds. Ash's experiment is a classic. It reveals how people will deny what they see and submit to group pressure. It allows us not only to observe conformity, but to study the conditions that increase or reduce its occurrence. All right, so here's what's important on this, okay? is that um, is that when the participant was allowed to write their answers, which is private, right? The others in the group couldn't hear their answer. They, they went along with their gut feelings most of the time. And because they weren't being judged by others. So now let's, let's fast forward this to where we are today. Social media. Everything is on social media. You want to discuss something? It's usually Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. They are the social media where we all communicate and we're going global. So it's very important that we communicate with everyone throughout the world. And then what they do is if you have a disagreeing opinion, instead of letting it be heard and let it, instead of letting it be discussed, they remove your account. They silence you. They shut you up. And what that's doing is exactly like they're doing here, where they're making, uh, they're making only one voice 
the incorrect answer in some cases, but I, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a parallel here. I'm not saying it is an incorrect answer. I'm saying you're only getting to hear the answer they want. So every post that says, A, if Twitter says we like this answer, they allow it to remain. If the post that says B, they disagree with, they either remove the account or suspend the account or demonetize or shadow ban or, um, uh, you know, just remove the account or deregulate, you know, and, and shadow ban it. And so what happens is everybody that's out there that is empathic and caring and, and I call it weak minded, but that's really not the case. It's that they're more caring versus logic and, and they're more emotional. When that happens, then those people look around and they see the answer A, 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 no Bs because the Bs have been removed. I guess A is the right answer. And now they become an A. This is how Germany happened. This is how people will vote for socialism because they're told, hey, this is the right way. We're going to care for people. You don't need to worry about those, uh, you know, the evil billionaires that make all this money, not realizing that many of the evil billionaires, and, and I'm not saying that they're not, there's not billionaires that are evil because they definitely are, but they also employ a lot of people. And so you end up getting the government deciding which answer you can hear, and that's the only answer you can hear. And it'll go so far as you look at the, the struggle sessions that they had in China, that if you disagree, you're publicly shamed, you're publicly hurt, you're publicly ended. Then the only answer you can say is A, what the state wants you to say. And again, it doesn't mean that you're stupid. It means at, at first, at first, it's because you say, I want to get along and I don't want to stand out or maybe I'm wrong. And so I'll go along with a group. But then there's going to be something that you agree with that you see silenced and removed. And you're going to say, "Uh oh, something's wrong. But now so many people are going along with it, even if 80 percent of the people don't think it's the right answer. They'll say it's the right answer because they feel like they're the only one that feels that way. That's how the, the socialists and communism and all of this controls everything is at first they make you afraid to stand out and afraid to speak out. The next step after that is they arrest you for speaking out and for standing up. And if that doesn't work, the next step is to make you disappear so you can't talk anymore about the way you feel. And, and it's forced conformity. And in the end, you end up with something like North, North Korea, where you must at all times uh, bow to Kim Jong-il and the family because if you – and they're starving to death. They are starving to death. They need shipments of food to come in and support North Korea. And if that food stops coming in, a vast majority of them would starve. But they still would rather say, I love it here. Everything is great. Everything is fine and slowly starve to death because they feel everybody else feels the same way. Because if they all stood up at once and they all fought back, yes, there would be quite a few casualties for sure. But they could probably overthrow the government. But they can't because they can't unionize. They can't get together. They can't get together as a group. And so everybody feels like, I guess I'm the only one that knows the truth, but I can't speak out because I'll get ended or I'll get hurt. So for those of you out there that come to channels, whether it's like mine or, or anything else, and you, you want to say I'm wrong or that this group is wrong or this group is wrong or this group's evil or that group's evil, that's not the way to view this. And it's not to look at the other side is stupid, no matter where you fall. The way to look at this is the the people that are all in and are very compassionate about this and are very strong in, they're not dumber, they're not smarter, they just think where their hearts and their emotion and their empathy and their and they're more artistic and they're more in in that type of personality than someone that is hard minded, logical, stoic, and set in what I believe I feel is right is what I feel is right. And I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, the other day, Myron Gaines, I did a video on Fresh and Fit where I said I disagree with how they handled everything that was going on. And Myron Gaines still had my number, uh, Instagram account, because that's how we communicated so I could go to their show. 
And he contacted me and he said, hey man, I wanna tell you what's going on. I wanna explain my side of things. And because I, I don't care for the video that you did about us, you know, I think it was kind of harsh. Like you should have reached out and talked to me first. And I said, that's fair enough. But I like these uh, uh, discussions to be out in the open so everybody can see the discussion so they can understand both sides of it because I think that's important. And so we talked for, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And at the end of it, my mind hadn't changed. I still don't like the way that they went about it. His mind didn't change. He still feels that that was the best course of action for them. Um, and he says he does have legal precedence behind it. And we shook hands and we said, okay, man, well, hey, you know what? Uh, we'll agree to disagree on this one, but hey, keep up the good work and, and good luck to you. Civil. Why? Because I, he's not going to convince me. I'm not going to convince him. But we know that. It was just a discussion to make our points heard. And I respect Myron for that, no matter what you think about him. It's also one of the reasons why I, I won't call them out a bunch of names and say a bunch of stuff about them, um, because while I may disagree, um, there are many takes to the world. Well, the same thing if you take a very empathic, emotional, whatever, Tory, Labor, um, uh, Democrat, Republican, and you say, um, okay, well, I'm in the right, you're in the wrong, and you're evil, and you're awful, and we should get rid of people like you. There's people on both sides that say that, but it is a, a small percentage. What happens is that percentage starts to grow. And there's people that are kind of feel like they're in the middle, like me, where I say, that's too extreme, that's too extreme. I, I like to pick and choose and I like to think my own way through this, which is the independence probably in the United States. Not saying all conservatives or all Democrats are like hardcore this way or that way. I'm not saying that. Um, I'm saying some of them can be. But many more people, as they see this, they're going to say, hey, you know what? I'm, I, I don't really align with anybody here. I'm just going to make the best choices for me in the world. But if they can silence people that speak out against either the, quote, party or against feminism or against uh, uh, BLM or against or for or whatever, they can get their narrative pushed through and people start falling in line. And with social media controlling that, this is going to happen more and more. This is the danger. This is why if you feel passionately about something, you have to be able to speak about it and express yourself without hate for the other side. Because the minute you come through with hate for the other side, they're immediately going to hate you. And they may hate you anyway. But that's why the logical reasoning has to, has to come through. But with social media shutting it down, you're going to have a harder time with that. That's why if you look at here, Facebook admits the truth. The fact checks are really just opinion. Now, they say lefty opinion. Um, we know that social media has an agenda. All of the social media has an agenda, and they are sticking to it. But on many posts that either conservatives or independents or people that are anti, anti-jab, anti anti-mask, whatever, when they put an opinion out, it's silenced immediately. And, and what they have been doing is they say they're using fact checks and fact check faults, fact checks disinformation, fact check this, fact check that, to be able to justify their removing of a dissenting voice. But here they say Facebook finally admitted the truth. The fact checks that social media use to police what Americans read and watch are just opinion. That's thanks to a lawsuit brought, brought by the celebrated journalist John Stossel, which has exposed the left's and, and they say left, uh, I, I, you kind of have to go along with that in this case, supposed battle against misinformation as a farce. Stossel posted a pair of videos that touched the third rail of liberal politics, climate change. Neither questioned whether climate change is real, but each talked about other issues, namely forest management and using technology to adapt. Yet the third party that Facebook contracts to review these pieces, science feedback flagged them as false or our favorite, lacking context. Why? Science Feedback didn't like Stossel's tone. That is, you can't write anything about climate change unless you say it's the worst disaster in history of humanity and we must spend trillions to fight it. For this, Facebook bans or minimizes Stossel's reporting, deprive him, de depriving him of readers and revenue. They go on about the case a little bit further. But the point is, the point is, he, they have, and YouTube does the same thing. YouTube, if you, if you do a video that states that client, 
climate change isn't real or it's not a threat to, to they remove it. They've even made this clear. It's now, I think, in their latest um, uh, their latest terms of service. So what they're doing is they're now saying, you must agree. And if you have a dissenting voice, we will silence that. And we're going to silence all of them until there's only one voice. And those of, uh, those of you that exist, those of you that are here today may not change your minds, but the young people that are coming onto these platforms will only hear one voice and it all says the same thing. And then when they hear a dissenting voice, if everybody's saying A, but that one person's saying B, it's easier for them to say that B is a, a knucklehead. They're an idiot. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, fake news, whatever, right? And they say so, and they go along with A. This is how you brainwash society. The interesting thing is with globalization right now, they're not trying to do it to the United States or Canada or Australia or whatever. They're trying to do it to everyone at once. And that's, that's critical. That's critical because if they can get the vast majority in America and Canada and the UK to follow along, then you'll have 70% of the globe on the same page. Then if you're a dissenter at that point, well, now it's not Germany 1940. Now it's the world 1940, and they can pack you away. And since the majority of people will either agree with or be so scared to say anything, that this that's what's going to happen. It, it'll just it'll become pervasive, and so the entire world is going to go the route of 1940. But instead of instead of the Jewish community or the the sick or the infirm being the ones that are removed permanently, it will be dissenters. And the 70% or 80% or whatever percentage remains will be completely compliant. Maybe not in this generation, but in the next generation. That's why they're teaching kids what they're teaching them in school today. Be aware of that. And uh, again, here's Meta. Facebook is now turning into Meta. As a global infrastructure giant, Facebook must uphold human rights. They say um, Facebook, its new corporate name, Meta, has always, and this is from uh, the conversation here, okay, has always wanted to get to know you. Its public goal has ostensibly been to connect people. It's been wildly successful in doing so by building out what can only be called everyday infrastructure around the world. There are 3.5 billion people worldwide using Facebook's suite of products, which includes Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp. As the infrastructure provider, uh, Facebook knows a lot about who its users are and what they do. Now, think about this. Think about what they're trying to do. If you want to meet up with friends, don't meet up at a coffee house. Don't meet up in the real world. Meet up on Meta, where they can control what's being said. If you're going to have a workplace meeting, well, you can't meet in a boardroom anymore. You can't meet up in a group anymore because of the bug. So now you have to meet up online. If you have to meet up online, use Meta. You can digitally sit around a table. But if they find out that a company, a person, a group is speaking back against the narrative that they want to put out there, they can remove said company from its services, said person from it. And that's the social pressure. Conform or be pushed out. And that becomes conform or be arrested. Conform and be isolated. Conform or die. This is what is being pushed through, but people keep focusing on the minors. Oh, Republicans versus Democrats. Oh, jabbed versus not jabbed. Oh, masked versus not masked. Globalist versus nationalist. That's not where it's going. They're trying to control the voice of society to where a larger group of people feel that they're in the right or they're scared to speak out against. And that's it. That's the end goal. And once that happens, it is very hard for the 10 or 15 or 20% to fight back against the 80% because there's false flags. You've got glowies that'll go out and working for the government that'll go out and do things. I mean, and if you don't think it doesn't happen, don't think that if a small uprising of people okay, that want to speak back against the common narrative, 
Don't think that the government wouldn't make a small group of fake uh, counter protesters go out and destroy a bunch of stuff. The media focuses on it and they shut everything down. Because on, on January 6th, Trump protesters went and broke in the Capitol. No one was ended except one woman, Ashley Babbitt, or I think it was Ashley, ba was it Babbitt? I forget her name. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong name. But anyway, a woman was ended by a police officer, but the civilians didn't go in with with any guns or any weapons uh, other than, you know, sticks and flagpoles and stuff like that. But it's been on the news for the last year. Back in 2019, President Trump had to go to the safety room in the White House because the protesters that were, uh, uh, I don't know if they were uh, BLM or or for the Democrat side or whatever, they were protesting and were attacking the White House fence line and were throwing, you know, uh, materials and things like that. And the news stated that Trump was being a baby because he had to go hide in his uh, uh, defense room for just some protesters. But if you look at both incidents, they were both very similar. Was there a council to study down on, on those incidents? No. Was it talked about years or months or even weeks later after it happened in the news? No. I'm not saying either was right or wrong. I'm not taking a side on that. My point is there's only one narrative that keeps getting talked about, which is why so many people that fight back against it and don't like one side or the other side, they feel they know what's going on because they only listen to a set set of voices. And that's the danger, is that as we have two sets of voices amping up both sides, and again, it could be any side of anything, there's going to be a clash. What they're hoping to do is avoid the clash by getting one side much stronger than the other side. And then the, instead of 50% versus 50%, then if it's 80 versus 20, they can, they can mark the 20% as dangerous, infected, stupid, uh, malconformists, malintent, the dangerous ones. We need to get rid of them. There's already people talking on Twitter right now that have said, hey, you know what? People that refuse the jab, they shouldn't get hospital treatment. They should just be left to die. How do you think about, how do you get to that point about your fellow human man that says, I, this is untested, like I'm unsure about this? It's because of the narrative. Let me talk about, uh, this will be very, very quick, okay? Um, so this is a story. I wasn't going to talk about the whole story, but this is a swipe, not right. Dating apps killed casual um, sex. It was so much easier when you could meet men in the supermarket, says SATC creator. Now, who was SATC? That's Sex in the City creator. They say um, uh, Sex in the City uh, writer Candace Bushnell says having a Mr. Big is not important today. Now, Mr. Big is this guy here, and I guess that's the main character. I don't even know her name. That's the main character's boyfriend. And she was always hoping to find that Mr. Big, the big, awesome, perfect guy. So Candace Bushnell, the creator, says it's not important to have him in your life today. It's not important to have him. This is her. And she says, it's about looking after yourself. It's about taking responsibility for yourself. It's about becoming a well-rounded person and making your own money. They say, but Candace, 63, who's divorced in her 50s, says being unattached is nothing like it was during the 1990s and uh, the aughts uh, when the show was in its heyday. She says, uh, there are plenty of women who want to be taken care of, but that happens less and less now. It's about being responsible for your own life. It's about buying your own shoes. And she says, uh, I think she said somewhere in here about kids, that it's not important to have children. Society pushed that. She says, um, Candace continues, and there's a point to this, so bear with me. I know you guys don't care about the story, but there's a point here. Candace continues, I never wanted kids, even when I was a kid. And in fact, I know many women who don't have children. Not one of them regrets it. They're like me. They're grateful they did not be forced into a lifestyle, a life that isn't right for them. Let's face it. At one point, women had to have children to survive. Those days are gone. In the future, fewer women, given the choice, will have children. 
quote from her, and this is what I want you to remember, quote from her, I never wanted kids, even when I was a kid. And in fact, I know many women who didn't, uh, who don't have children and not one of them regrets it. She's very clear. She never wanted children. She never wanted children, not even since she was a kid. And she doesn't regret it. This is from uh, two, what, two, three days ago, December 14th. Let's go back to this interview from 2019, just two years ago. This is from Candace, same woman. Uh, let me see if I can find the quote. She says, she told the Sunday Times last weekend, when I got divorced and I was in my 50s, I started to see the impact of not having children and of truly, truly being alone. I do see that people with children have an anchor in a way that people who have no kids don't. They say here, admitting to wishing you'd put, you'd put having kids above having enormous career success feels like a bit of a diversion from the feminist playbook, a playbook which claims to value motherhood and personal success equally sometimes doesn't follow through on that promise. Now, how did just two years ago, she said, you know what? I see uh, women that had kids and ha they have a grounded and they're happy. I see that now. And she did, uh, in, later on, I don't wanna read the whole interview. She did say she had regrets not having a family and focusing too much on work. But she was already too old to have kids at this point. This is just two years ago. And now she's 60 something, I think they said. Let me look at that other article. She's 60 something. So her years of, of child, she's 63. So when she gave this interview, she was 61. It was already past her time to have kids. So it's not sour grapes. It's not like she wanted kids then, but didn't get a chance to have them. And now she's angry. No, she was, when she gave that interview, she was long past fertility years. So what changed? The social pressure. The social pressure of saying, it's okay to be a mom. It's okay to want children. It's okay to want to be married. It's okay to let him make money and, and be the masculine one. It's okay. Just in two years, she went to, you know what? I'm happy. I'm glad I didn't do it. I never wanted it. All the women I know, they don't want it either. Push the message, push the message, push the message. Must push the message. Do you think she honestly believes this? No, of course not, because just two years ago, she didn't. So either she changed her mind because everybody else says, ah, kids, you don't want kids, or she's conforming. And then someone else that sees her message says, well, all these people say that they're happier without kids, so they must be. But the truth is, Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just conforming. Push the message. Push the message. Push the message. This is why so many times, you know, I say, I can say, hey, you know what? I like some of the things that Trump did. Oh, you right wing stupid Trumper. Nope, 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 nope. You can appreciate a thing on its own without being in the hive mind, without being amongst the collective. So when I say, hey, you know what? I like something that Trump did. I like the fact that Bernie Sanders said some things that I actually agree with. Trump said some things I agree with. And one side will attack me and the other side will attack me because I've said something that agrees with the other side. Hive mind. And if you find yourself very, very passionate about something, whether it's BLM, LGBTQ, Democrats, Republicans, globalism, climate change, whatever. If you find yourself like, oh, that other side needs to go away. They're evil. They're evil. If you feel like that about anything, you've slipped into the hive mind. The people that disagree with you, they don't think you're evil. They don't think, I mean, some of them do, don't get me wrong. But a lot of people are just like, hey, I got, I got to get more data on this. I, I got to see more science on this. I've personally heard about the world ending because of acid rain in the 80s and freezing over in the 70s and no food left by 2000 and you know worldwide flooding by 2013 and now something else i've heard this for 40 years and when you see uh you know i, I can't think of many examples but i nancy pelosi retiring to florida to buy a beach house and I don't know of any Republicans. I would certainly use a Republican example if I knew as well. I'm not saying one group is better than the other. 
I'm just saying, when you see them going down and buying a beach house on the ocean front, do you really think they're, they think the sea levels are going to rise and the ice caps are going to melt? Why would they buy on ocean front property if that were the case? Again, all I'm saying is you have to, you have to realize that the goal of many people on both sides of the party, on both sides of government, on, on, uh, in multiple different countries everywhere, it's about getting a majority control so much so and getting the, uh, them so afraid and so worked up about the other side that you have conformity like they do in the Ash Conformity video clip. Guys, make sure you share this video, please. Get this information out there. And even if people disagree with me, I don't care. Look into it. Look outside of what you're fed every day on the news and on social media. Get off that stuff. Start digging deeper. Start listening to independent voices. Start looking at people that are saying, I'm using logic. I'm using awareness. I'm using my brain versus emotion. Emotion is not what you want to deal with when you're going into bad times, but they want you to. There's nothing that can happen in society today that will make me hate women or hate black people or Latinos. Doesn't matter. If a minority person were to end my mother tomorrow, that's not a whole. I might really hate that one person, no matter what group they belong to, but they're not the group. But that's what they're pushing right now. That is what everyone is trying to push. You must belong to a group. Groupthink. 1984. Read it, study it, learn it. Groupthink. That's what we're pushing for. 1984, you know, it, it's funny, we joke about this, but when you look at the underpinnings of editing the information that you're giving, editing what you're allowed to hear, editing what you're allowed to say, I'm going to bring, uh, I'm going to bring this up real quick. This is from Merriam-Webster. Now this changed. This changed recently. A person who opposes the use of, of medication or regulations mandating. Do you see that? That's new, boys and girls. That's new. They changed the definition of being an anti-vaxxer. It's not only a person who opposes the use of them, but also who, uh, uh, who opposes regulations mandating them. That's brand new, boys and girls. 1984. They rewrite history every day. The past no longer exists, only what the party wants you to believe. It has changed and updated constantly. And many people think that Orwell uh, predicted the future. It wasn't that. He knew what the Soviet Union was doing. And he was basically just rewriting what a lot of the Soviet Union did back in, what was it, 1950s, 40s. Understand what's happening. Be aware. All right, lastly, let's move on to a dating profile of the day. All righty here, we have uh, this lovely young lass, self-entitled Tinder veteran. This is a story on Cheeseburger. I haven't met on Cheeseburger in years. Uh, this, this gal is a foot model, apparently. She's attractive. Uh, her her username on Tinder is undercover foot model. Please do not go and attack this person. We don't like that. Leave her alone. Be nice, gentlemen. We just do this for entertainment purposes only. She says trying to get a hundred dollar minimum dinner on a first date. That is her. That is the title of this Reddit post, and they post this picture down below. He a guy responds to her. He says, "Damn, you're trying to go as fancy as hell for a first date." She says, "If you're broke, just say that." He said, no, nah, I do fine. I'm just in med school. 
I don't go for that big on first dates. Not my style. I'm sure you will find some guy desperate enough uh, to spend $100 on you for a first date. She says, I'm a Tinder veteran, sadly. I have been on many a nice first dates, haha. And LOL at guys who think nice dates equals desperate. Very much usually the opposite. He says, well, cl clearly, since you're a Tinder veteran, you must be doing something right on these dates to make the guys stay. Someone says, plot twist, she's broke. Somebody says, savage that this exists, but I can't tell if it was done ironically or unironically because it was banned. Someone banned this post from Reddit. Again, gotta, you got to talk the narrative or you're not going to be allowed to... Uh, it says, edit, lots of people thinking I was asking if people actually go on dates for moral, uh, morally questionable reasons. Of course it happens. I was asking whether the sub was created by those allied with or mocking the original FDS. Seems like it was the latter. Yep, so they made fun of female dating strategy, and this got removed from uh, uh, Reddit. Again, you must comply with the narrative. It says uh, Somebody says on here, I'm a Tinder veteran clown world. Somebody else, it's probably safe to assume this one stays on Tinder to look for free expensive meals to boost her own ego. Someone else says, this is why based on the advice of a female friend, all my first dates were coffee and planned for one hour. If it goes well, you can always make it longer or go get dinner. Best advice ever. And, and they just kind of go through here, tearing it up. This is on cheeseburger.com, one of their posts. But why would... Why would a woman think that it, this is okay to ask for a $100 dinner just to go out with a guy? Now, why would guys think it's okay to spend $100 to, to try to go on a date with a pretty girl? It's the message. Women deserve it. Men are not of good value. Men are worthless. Men are not needed. We don't need your money. We don't need you for children. We can just sleep with you, get pregnant, and dump you. We don't need your resources. We work on our own. Men are strong, or excuse me, women are strong. Women are more clever. Women are more whatever. We don't need you anymore, men. And they're going to keep pushing that. And this young gal, I mean, I don't know how much pipe she's had laid in her for this. And it doesn't say her age. But she's going to go on like this and on like this because... A, 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 B, A, A, A. The, the Bs that are out there are being told that A is the way to go and you will be happy. And they're being told that by people that have been brainwashed into believing it. And they've been told that by people that don't agree with it, but think that they're in the wrong. And so they're going to say, well, it's not working out for me, but maybe it'll work out for you. The brainwashing of society. So, guys, uh, please, again, please share this. Get this out to some people. Let them see what's going on. It doesn't matter what side you're on. It doesn't matter what you believe. What matters, well, I mean, it does, but what matters that you don't get into any camp so deeply that you view the other side as dangerous or malicious or they should be ended. 50% of Americans right now think that we should be a nation divided. I'm starting to agree with that, and I'll tell you why. It's not that I agree left versus right. What I don't agree with is authoritarianism. I don't agree with silencing speech. I don't agree with disarming citizens. I don't agree with mandating uh, passports to, to be able to go eat and groceries and to prove your history. I don't agree with social credit scores. Stop thinking in the binary of Republican versus Democrat. Start thinking of, am I free or am, am I becoming trapped? Am I losing freedom? Am I gaining freedom? And you know what? If, there's, if, you're, if you're a fan of the Republicans, but the Republican goes along with taking away your freedoms or silencing you or, or falls into any of this trope, Fight back if you believe in freedom. And you know what? And if you're a if you're somebody that wants socialism more than anything on this planet, fight back against those those people that are fighting for freedom. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, if it's just you and I left, I'm going to fight for my freedom and I won't give up. I'll tell you that much right now.
Guys, if you'd like to support my work, uh, links are below as always. Go check out my older videos. Join me over on betterbachelor.locals.com. Um, we just did a movie night where I streamed the 1982 John Carpenter's The Thing. And uh, yeah, like a thousand people have watched it. I get to stream movies over there because it's not YouTube. And I, I talked live over it and made comments and, and had some discussion. We had a really good time. Join me over there as a supporter today. Free speech forums. And that way, if you want to plead for why you think communism is good, go over there and plead your case. Uh, I don't, just don't think it'll turn out too well for you. Guys, we'll see you in the next one, and uh, I'll talk to you real, real soon. Mm -hmm.